Поехали, yes. <laughs> you speak Russian. So, uh, Professor Gale, thank you for accepting my invitation to have this conversation with you about your personal experience in Soviet Union in the days right after the Chernobyl uh, catastrophe, Chernobyl accident. Uh, let me start with two opening questions. First one is, how did the U.S. officials uh, react to the accident? And how did the business you know, the U.S. business react, you know, respond to to the catastrophe, you know, to the needs of the Soviet people, etc. Well, um, you know, with regard to the U.S. government, um, you know, I went uh, as an international um, observer and helper. I, I didn't go with the auspices. I advised the U.S. government that I was going. But I didn't, uh, I wasn't involved with them. I didn't request permission or anything of that sort. So I can't really respond with regard to the U.S. government other than to say they, you know, they didn't, um, they were in no way obstructive. And um, after I was in Moscow for a few weeks, I, I did have quite good um, conversations with our ambassador there. Um, with regard to business, um, you know, after uh, I arrived in Moscow and uh, met with my Soviet colleagues and we decided which resources we needed, um, businesses all over the world, not just the United States, but um, businesses in, um, in Europe, businesses uh, in Asia, they all donated substantial amounts of uh, rather heavy equipment that we flew into, into Moscow. So I think everyone, you know, certainly Americans, when I met with Mr. Gorbachev mm -hmm. um, some weeks later, uh, he showed me, um, he brought out a bunch of letters and envelopes that he'd gotten from American citizens where they, um, sh you know, they expressed their concern. And some of them included small donations, you know, donations of five and ten dollars that yeah. they, you know, that they mailed in to to help. I believe that uh, your friend uh, Armand Hammer, he also describes that uh, that episode in his book, especially in the chapter about uh, Chernobyl uh, accident. Um, was was Mr. Gorbachev aware of the scale and possible consequences of the Chernobyl accident? Um, I eventually, of course, yes. I mean, I can't really say. Uh, how, how soon, but um, my Russian or my Soviet colleague, uh, Andrei Vorobyov, was part of a um, Chernobyl commission to the Politburo, and he certainly was aware of the situation. And um, so I know that that commission was advising the Politburo on the scale of the accident. Okay. Um we're gradually coming to your field of expertise, but still I need to ask one or two more introductory questions, so to say. Sure. Uh, are you still of the opinion that that was a human mistake? You know, the whole accident was due to the operators of the reactor at that time who were ignoring the uh, indications of the sensors, controlling sensors. Yeah, no, I, I don't um, I don't think that, and I, I never thought that. I mean... Um, you almost never get these accidents in isolation. And there were some fundamental um, concerns about the construction of the RBMK-type reactors. I mean, even before the accident, years before the accident, it had been pointed out that there were certain, um, certain things, there are technical things, I just mentioned void coefficients and things like that, about the RBMK reactors that, you know, led people to be concerned about them. The, the other thing is that, you know, because of the nature of these reactors, they're huge compared to, uh, let's say, Western reactors uh, and, and, some, and some Russian reactors. But these RBMK reactors are huge, and you cannot put a containment structure around them. It's just impossible. So... Um, Yes, I mean, there were mistakes on the part of the operators, but those mistakes alone would not have led to the accident in the absence of what I would call design flaws. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, arriving upon arriving to Moscow, I believe that happened on May 1st in 86. Uh, in your memoirs and also in the book of uh, Mr. Hammer, Hammer uh, you explained that uh, you were mainly working in the, in the hospital number six. So all the measures concerning those 31 casualties, uh, you draw the conclusion from the numbers which you were treating at that hospital. But uh, also you point out that in due course of time, we may come to an estimate of 11 to 25,000 cancers over 80 years. So uh, could you explain more in detail about this? Is it correct to consider that between 11 to 25,000 people may have developed cancer, uh, may develop cancer for the next 80 years, considering the date of the incident in Chernobyl? Sure. Uh, first, let me just um, correct one thing. Okay. So we had we had 29 deaths um, in Moscow, mm -hmm. and there were two other people that were killed, you know, and whose bodies were never recovered. Yeah. So the the 31 figure is uh, not just Moscow, but it's it's everybody. Um, well, you know, um, to answer your question about estimates. Uh, th this is complicated because our our um, our models, you know, mm -hmm. for estimating the 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 consequences of radiation exposure, particularly with regard to cancer, our models are um, based on mostly on the victims of the atomic bomb explosions mm -hmm. in Japan, mm -hmm. and um, you know that the exposure circumstances were completely different. The atomic bomb survivors, you know, they were exposed to a very high dose of radiation instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And then they've been followed for the last 70 or 80 years. Uh, so very instantaneous exposure to very high dose radiation, all of it external. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, when we move to the Chernobyl situation, we're dealing in a completely different model because people are being exposed to radiation uh, over many years, and most of it in the first year or the first two years. Um, the, the amount of radiation is, is low dose, and it's the dose and the dose rate. So we're, we're taking the atomic bomb model, mostly, not in, entirely. We're taking the atomic bomb model, and we're trying to apply it to a different model, the mm -hmm. Chernobyl, you know, the Chernobyl accident. And so, you know, our our policy is to be overly conservative, you know, to assume the worst case and estimate what might happen. So I think the revised figures uh, would be closer to 4,000 to 11,000 cancers okay. over 80 years. But uh, I have to point out that, you know, what would happen ordinarily, let's say mm -hmm. there were no no Chernobyl accident. Mm -hmm. Well, we would expect 200 million cancers. So fundamentally, we're trying to look for, let's say, 4,000 or 11,000 cancers mixed in with 200 million. So it's, I think it's obvious that we, we can't detect that. We would never know. And you know, people change their habits. They, you know, they may smoke more, they may smoke less. Or they may drink uh, drinking, more. for example. You give the example of drinking in the Soviet Union. Sure. So, yeah. I mean, uh, especially amongst the liquidators. So, there, there's no way that we will ever know whether there were any cancers. Um, if there were a huge number of cancers, of course, we could detect that, like we did with thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was, a special, that was a special case. It was such a huge number that we were certain that thyroid cancers in, only in children were increased in the first 10 or 15 years. But for the other cancers, we'll never know. And, uh, you know, I have to point out that you and I, you mm -hmm. know, men, well, we have about a 43% chance to get cancer in our lifetime. So roughly one, of it, one in two chance that you and I will get cancer. Now, you know, what would the Chernobyl radiation do? Well, mm -hmm. maybe that would move it to 43.1%. You know, it's not 
it's not more than that. So if you think about smoking or drinking or other things, um, it's not something that is, is a detectable difference. I see. Okay. Uh, further, when you speak about these numbers, do you consider also the fact that the liquidators you mentioned, most of them were uh, military troops, you know, soldiers, and they were sent there and they were actually able and allowed to, uh, you know, to, to work on the field for just a few seconds, like 90 seconds or something like that. After that, they were sent either back or treated any some other way. So, um, sure. Do you know about? Do Do you have any numbers, precise or approximate numbers about how many military troops were involved in the uh, liquidation process? Sure. Yeah, we have a pretty good idea. It's mm -hmm. about. Uh, it, it's about seven hundred and fifty thousand people altogether. And um, they have been studied very, very carefully. And um, there is, I would say, good news about them. Um, and that is that uh, there's one, one kind of leukemia that some people think might be increased, um, and that's called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, this is a, a little bit strange because that's the one leukemia that we we did not find was increased after the atomic bombs, and which we, we don't think in general uh, is a cancer that can be caused by radiation. So we, we have some reports um, of a increase in you, only in the Ukrainian um, liquidators, not in the any Belarusian or you know, uh, Estonian or Latvian or Russian. So we have a, this one report of a slight increase in a, in a very rare kind of leukemia. But the very good news is that we don't have any increase in the usual kinds of leukemias that were caused by radiation. And that's important because after the atomic bombs, leukemias were the most increased kind of cancer. And they occurred about 10 years after the, the atomic bomb explosions. And other cancers like breast cancer or lung cancer, you know, the more common cancers, colon cancer, um, they, they took 30 or 40 years to occur. So um, trying to be optimistic, the fact that we haven't seen a spike in leukemias in these 30 or more years makes it very unlikely that we will see an increase in other cancers. Oh. It, it doesn't, mean, doesn't mean they haven't occurred, you know, because... It's just that their level could be so low that we can't detect them. Okay. Are there any available or uh, available to you at least um, overall researches in the former Soviet Union area, uh, uh, including you know uh, Russian Federation, Belarus, and Ukraine, probably the most affected countries? So that sure. we may. Well, I mean, okay. The... Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. No. Yes. The answer is yes. I mean, there are ongoing studies in each of those countries of uh, the population and of the liquidators coming from those areas. You know, as you can imagine, uh, with the uh, end of the Soviet Union, uh, now the researchers like myself, well, we have to deal with three different governments. Okay, we have to deal with Belarus, got to deal with Ukraine, got to deal with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the relations between those countries are not always brilliant, uh, <laughs> Ukraine and Russia. Especially these days. For, these days. Um, and so, for example, if I want to get from Moscow to Kiev, you know, I have to stop in Minsk. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, our research is, um, is difficult, mm -hmm. uh, being impeded a bit. And then, of course, you have the fact that we, you know, in, in after the atomic bomb explosions, we had a group of people that were exposed that lived in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But we also had a, a group of people, about 30,000, that were residents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but they were not in the city on that day. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, we could compare the people that were in the city that day 
with the people that weren't in the city that day. And therefore, we can come up with some pretty precise I estimates okay. of how many cancers were caused by radiation and by what dose of radiation. Now, when you consider, you know, the uh, affected populations after the Chernobyl accident, well, you know, we don't have a control group. We don't have a group to compare it with. And that, that, that limits our ability to draw any solid scientific conclusions. May that uh, lack of, you know, control, control group uh, be, uh, you know, may the reason for that lack of control group be the fact that most of the liquidators, especially the military troops, you know, the soldiers, are still kept in secret? Well, we, uh, I, can, I can only speak in detail about Ukraine, mm -hmm. where we, we, and also some of the, uh, you know, Estonia and Latvia, where we have very, I'd say, very complete um, records. Okay. Uh, and we have good access to okay. the, the liquidators. Okay. So, uh, further, uh, do, you have, do you have an idea, can you, can you recall or explain how did the government at that time uh, react, uh, react to the issue of contaminated food? Like what I have read in the media, even nowadays, not from that time, is that, for example, the meat from that area was mixed, you know, contaminated meat was mixed with non-contaminated, and this is how it was sold to the, um, you know, population in general. So what was the response of the Soviet officials at that time in regards to the contamination of the food? Yeah, so I can only give you, a, you know, a general okay. answer. Um, but, um, you know, um, first, you know, the area immediately around the, the Pripyat in the area around the nuclear power station. Well, you know, as you know, this is a very rural area. Mm -hmm. And um, people, you know, many elderly people, but people living on farms, and they are living off of the food that they produce, you know. Now, normally we, we try to quarantine food Mm -hmm. And um, the most the most important example I, I want to give you is milk. Okay. Now, when when the radioactive cloud passes over an area and it rains, the radioactive cloud contains radioactive iodine. Mm -hmm. And if it rains, then that iodine is deposited on the grass. Okay. And you know, cows are eating the grass; they are producing milk. And people, but I'm especially focused on children who drink a lot of milk. So children are drinking this milk. And that was one of the three factors that contributed. Now, we were not able to quarantine that milk. Um, and so those children were exposed to this radioactive milk. And that's why we have this uh, explosion of thyroid cancers. We have about 7,000 cases, and we think about 2,500 are related to radiation. Now, I just want to contrast that to our uh, situation in the Fukushima accident, okay. you know, another big nuclear accident. Now, in Fukushima, we, quarantined, we were able to quarantine all the milk. So we, we took all the milk. No one was allowed. None of the children were allowed to drink that milk. And we then uh, just kept it. Now, it's, it, this may sound hard to believe, but if you take radioactive milk and you keep it for three months, mm -hmm. it would become it becomes non-radioactive cheese <laughs> because the well because the iodine has a half life of eight days, mm -hmm. and after ten you know after eighty days, ten half lives, it's gone. Mm -hmm. So if you can withhold that milk, which is now cheese, if you can withhold it from the market, then you wind up with just perfectly safe cheese. Okay. So we don't, we don't expect any cases of thyroid cancer after Fukushima. But of course, as I've said, we have a number of cases of thyroid cancer from contaminated milk. Mm -hmm. Now, with, you know, with regard to, to other products, meat and, and uh, vegetables and things like that. Now, uh, we have to understand that Meat is just like you and you and I are radioactive. 
Okay. Normal people are radioactive, and so are all animals. So every, everything we eat, or normally eat, or normally drink, everything, and, and us, everything is radioactive. Okay. So now we're not talking about radioactive or not, we're talking about how radioactive. And we have some international guidelines whereby, um, you know, there's a certain amount of radiation per kilogram of meat. That kind of meat cannot be sold. Now, th these regulations are overly conservative because they assume that people, you know, are living solely on meat, you know, that they're eating kilos and kilos and kilos <laughs> of meat. But of course, if you remember the Soviet Union back in 1986. <laughs> yeah, I have some you, memories. You, I was born in 69. You, 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 you may be too young, but, you know, <laughs> nobody was eating kilos and kilos and kilos <laughs> of meat. Okay. So, uh, I mean, you'd be lucky to get some sausage uh, at the local we were, supermarket. We were, we were joking at that time that sausages were made out of uh, toilet paper, by the way. Yeah, so well, that, 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 <laughs> I don't exclude that, that possibility. But in any event, uh, so, you know, the exposure from, you know, from food is, is not a huge issue. I mean, we have very strict guidelines But it's actually not a huge issue now. Whether the Soviet authorities complied with those issues or not, I can't say. Okay. But I will tell you one thing. We have, the, we have the same issue in Japan where Fukushima, the, which is, a, like a, is like an oblast, let's say, the Fukushima oblast. Now, that was famous for its meat. And, of course, you know, even today... Um, oblast? Russian years. word oblast, region. Right. Okay. So Fukushima is like an oblast. Um, so it had famous meat, and people were paying a lot of money to get um, meat from F Fukushima oblast. Now, of course, after the accident, even today, people are reluctant, and the price you know, of meat from Fukushima oblast has gone down. But um, you know, everything is relative. So every month... In Los Angeles, I receive a box of food from Fukushima Oblast. Um, you know, I, I, I buy mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. uh, box of food, including meat, and I'm perfectly happy to eat it. Just um, to prove because that not, uh, it's not contaminated. Well, you know, as I said, all everything is, is you know, radioactive. But the point is that I'm not, you know, eating, I'm not living there and eating it as my only source of food. Okay. And so the danger to me, I mean, I have more danger flying to Moscow or more radiation, let's say. During I get the, more radiation flying to Moscow or flying to Tokyo than I'm getting from eating uh, steak from uh, Fukushima Oblast. Okay, I see. So we, we, have, we have to keep those things yeah. in perspective. I'm, I'm vegetarian, so naturally I don't have that issue. But uh, let's, you know, let's get to the last serious question from our conversation. This, you know, 31 casualties, uh, considering all that you said so far, is it not fair to say that this number is not precise? Well, um, you know, we come to a, a difficult uh, situation because, as I said, you know, You and I have a 50% chance of getting cancer. Now, let's say you have a helicopter pilot who was involved in the Fukushima, um, in the uh, Chernobyl accident. Mm -hmm. Now, that, that pilot also has a 50% chance of getting cancer. And if he gets cancer, and especially if he gets leukemia, we have no way of knowing You know, because we don't have these controls that I mentioned. Okay, I see. We have no way of knowing whether his leukemia was caused by his activities at Chernobyl or not. Now, you know, the government, a government, and this is not scientists, a government may say, um, well, this was a brave fellow. He risked his life to help uh, deal with the accident. Mm hmm And we're going to give him compensation. Receive. We're going to give him a pension okay. or we're going to give him health care. Yeah, so that, that's a political decision. It's not a scientific decision. And so, you know, there will be, for example, we have uh, recently, very recently, 
one of the workers in uh, Japan developed cancer, and the government decided that they were going to give him compensation. I see. Okay. Okay. So, you know, people will assume that the fact that he's being given compensation means that his cancer was caused by his Fukushima activities. Or if, if the Russian government gives a liquidator compensation, people will assume that their cancer was caused by it. But that, that, that's a nice thing. I mean, in my opinion, that is a nice thing because these people, you know, risk their lives mm -hmm. to help. But whether their cancer was really caused by Fukushima or Chernobyl, and we would never know that. Okay, and so, so, so it's fair to it, conclude that this number of 31 casualties, it's the scientific, scientifically proven without any questions. Right, I think, okay. you know, we have no question um, that these 31 people died because of the, the Chernobyl accident. Now, you know, not all of them died of radiation. Uh, a number of them died because of the fire or because of the explosion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or because mm -hmm. of the chemicals released. I see. And many, many times the same person, you know, if you think about a firefighter who gets very close to the burning graphite of the reactor, mm -hmm. well, and we saw many such people, that person has both radiation and uh, burns from the fire. And so we're pretty good at rescuing people from radiation. We're not perfect, of course, but we're pretty good about rescuing people from radiation. Okay. But they, they may go on to die of their burns. I see. Okay. Or damage to, damage to their lung from, you know, from chemicals. So, you know, yes, there are 31 deaths. Yes, it's extremely sad. Um, but they really result from a combination of all of these injuries and oh, not yeah. just from radiation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah since you since you involved in all the politics in uh, uh, let's say you know measuring you know the, the reasons or the contribution of persons involved in the liquidation process so if you're willing only if you're willing to answer one political question i'll be happy to hear your your answer on that uh, there are plenty of plenty of papers which are declassified these days showing that the KGB, the Soviet authorities, were quite aware of the flaws of that kind of reactor, RBMK reactors. And you also, in one of your articles, you also write about plutonium, military-grade plutonium, which was the main reason to use those reactors which were banned in the United States and uh, Europe. So um, what's your comment on that negligence from the side of Soviet authorities and the KGB regarding the flows of the RBMK reactors these days? Can we relate this to the accident as well? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think the, uh, the flaws of the RBMK reactor design were quite well known you know, publicly amongst nuclear engineers. It, it was known and discussed uh, at the International Atomic Energy Agency, or MAGATE. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is no, you know, no secret. And um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a governmental decision. Now, you know, to be, let me be fair. Okay. Dur during the Second World War, um, when the United States was producing our atomic bombs, mm -hmm. we had a huge, uh, I would say, semi-secret um place to produce uh, uranium, uh, plutonium in Washington State, which is on the west coast, the, mm -hmm. the north west coast. And th that, that plant uh, was not properly managed. And so even today, we have uh, many people living around that. It's called the Hanford Nuclear Facility. We have thousands of people living around the Hanford nuclear facility who claim that they have cancer because of radiation exposure. The, the wastes from that facility were stored in, you know, underground tanks that are disintegrating and depositing mm -hmm. the radiation into the Columbia River mm -hmm. and poisoning the fish and things like that. So, 
I just want to say that, uh, you know, governments, especially during the Cold War, during the Second World War, raise the virus. Uh, not not everything goes according to plan. Uh, scientists are not always listened to. Um, people make decisions that, in retrospect, we can say were you know foolhardy. You know, they they were poor decisions. They maybe put people at risk unnecessarily, and so forth and so on. So yeah, I agree that these were you know bad decisions. But I, I, I can't say that I that the Soviet government was certainly not alone in, in making in these kind of bad decisions, which okay. is no it's it, it's no comfort to the victims, of course. Yeah, I see. But every government makes, makes these kind of bad decisions. OK, so, uh, Professor, I think we covered more or less all the points I, would, I, I wanted to uh, talk to you about. Thank you very much. This was an honor for me to talk to a you know, person who was directly involved in uh, helping the victims of the Chernobyl catastrophe back in uh, 1986. Thank you once again for having me you know, talking to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for your very, uh, very good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do svidanya. <laughs> Do vizhdane, we say in Bulgarian, but do svidanya in Russian, yes. Okay, take care. Uh, professor, I'm sorry for forgetting m probably the most important question for Bulgarians. At that time, right after the accident, were there any serious reasons for us in Bulgaria to worry about? Well, um, I would say yes and no. Uh, yes, in the sense that Bulgaria was one of the more heavily contaminated areas outside the boundaries of the former Soviet Union. But, um, you know, we have surveillance of um, things like birth defects and cancers in Bulgaria. And, you know, for a variety of reasons that we've discussed, um, it's very, very unlikely that there would be very serious health effects, you know, that we could detect in Bulgaria. But it was one of the heavily contaminated areas. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. That was all. Thank okay. you once again. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Bye.